set against the grain. Good evening, everybody. Welcome back to the shop. Here's hoping we'll have a little bit better quality this week. I did some tests in the uh, off week and played around with some stream settings and we'll see, at least on my end, YouTube says everything's copacetic. So welcome back, Renaissance Woodworker Live. This week I'm talking about, primarily I'm talking about why I don't really like using shoulder planes. More importantly, why I feel I kind of graduated away from shoulder planes. But at face value, this is a shoulder plane versus rabbit plane discussion, which I think will be particularly beneficial to a lot of you folks who were having trouble in the Veritas second sale today and couldn't get your shoulder planes. Maybe I can make you feel a little bit better about that, about that, that buyer's, that buyer's remorse, or is it buyer's remorse when you couldn't buy it? That's fear of missing out. I don't know, whatever. We are going to talk about um, where a lot of people tend to use shoulder planes and why I ended up buying one. I wrote a, a blog post, like good old fashioned blog post, no audio, no video, nothing probably, I don't know, seven years ago on the Renaissance Woodworker that talked about why I never use my shoulder plane. Long story short, when I started getting into hand tools, I remember seeing shoulder planes everywhere. All of the pundits, all of the authors, everybody was saying you needed to have a shoulder plane. This was a must have tool. So I bought um, a medium sized shoulder plane from Lee Nielsen and a uh, cool tool, beautiful tool and it ended up just gathering dust. So I sold it and I thought, you know what? Maybe the problem is, is the medium just wasn't big enough. So I went out and I bought a large Veritas shoulder plane. I was kind of in a Veritas phase at that point, buying a lot of Veritas tools. And um, that ended up gathering a lot of dust. I would use it from time to time, but every time I reached for it, I was blowing off all this dust and it started to occur to me, why am I not using this? What am, what am I doing? Um, what tool am I using instead? So in the blog post, I actually talked about a couple of specific situations, trimming um, tenon shoulders, trimming tenon cheeks. Um, oh shoot, I've got my notes here. Let me make sure I get everything on this blog post right. Um, certainly trimming the cheeks of, of philisters or ingrain rabbits and then actually cutting rabbits themselves and how um, there's just so many better tools than the shoulder plane for doing this. So as uh, suggested by uh, one of my lovely patrons who supported the show, see that little lower third? Yeah, that's what they did. Now we're doing a show specifically for that. This is the power that you as a patron have, um, which I'm gonna remove that while I'm thinking about it. Um, he had asked, can I actually demonstrate how um, I would do these different techniques without using a shoulder plane. So I figured what I would do is show using the shoulder plane and an alternative, which spoiler alert, the alternative tends to be a rabbit plane. So let's talk about this. First of all, rabbits and shoulder planes. The shoulder plane is really a more modern invention. Modern meaning, you know, turn of the 19th century. Really at around 1850 or so, we started to see infill rabbit planes showing up on the market where they would have brass sides and you know some sort of dense tropical wood in between and it was still a rabbit plane not a shoulder plane and i suppose we should kind of define one of those key differences there the rabbit plane it's a block of wood <laughs> with the blade and a wedge and it's bedded at a 45 degree angle, if not a little bit higher. A lot of these wooden planes were actually bedded slightly higher than that. The shoulder plane, most noticeable difference, it is a low angle plane. It's bedded at 25 degrees. Well, you can imagine this little bit of steel down here just would not be possible in a wooden plane. There's just no way you could shape a bit of wood like this and not have it be fragile and snap off. Whereas on the higher angle rabbit plane, you can see there's a substantial amount of wood and that works. The next obvious thing here is in the low angle shoulder plane, we have the blade uh, bedded bevel up. So right away we start thinking, okay, this is a lower angle. This is probably more of kind of an ingrain type tool. The other issue is 
we don't really have any escapement on this plane. When the shavings come out, they curl up right here in the mouth and they're not ejected to one side or the other. The rabbit plane has a conical escapement that actually shoots the plane or shoots the shaving out one side or the other. This one actually um, is designed to shoot it off to the left. This modern version by Matt Bickford has a very clear, you could see the, the blind side of the plane here. Uh, it's a little bit sharper, whereas this has an open bevel to it. It's designed to shoot the shaving off to the left as I'm planing because this is a left-handed tool. This little guy actually has a bi-directional escapement. It's got kind of a point in the middle and there's a chamfer on both the blind side, actually this is the blind side, and the active side. Is that what it's called? Blind side, active side, I don't know. The blade side and the, and the, the blind side. The shaving can really go in either direction. A lot of it depends upon how you're using it. In other words, this is a little bit more of an ambidextrous rabbit plane. But I mean, that's kind of the big difference is that low angle, the bedding of the blade versus the higher angle bevel down blade of the rabbit plane. And this translates to the, the functional usage. So we saw a rabbit plane that was an infill design around the 1850s. Really, as we got closer to 1880, 1890, we started to actually see a metal shoulder plane show up. Um, and it was a low angle plane, but it was most definitely designed to be for refinement. It was not designed to remove a bunch of material. It was just meant to come in and, and tweak a joint, remove a little bit of material, true up a joint that maybe was out of square or slightly out of flat and, and fix that. The rabbit plane, and this is where I think a lot of us by modern standards get in trouble, this sucker is meant to remove wood. This hauls wood off really fast. When you're cutting a rabbit, you don't want to spend a bunch of time making a bunch of passes. You want to hog out wood. So this was designed to really hog out wood. It's got a nice wide open mouth. It can be quite aggressive. Again, the higher bed angle allows you to be much more aggressive than you would with the lower bed angle. These were most definitely not joinery forming tools, but joinery refinement tools. And I think even to today, you're gonna to find that that's really the key differentiator between these. Um, certainly they can be used in a couple of different ways. Um, are a couple of different tasks, but primarily we're about light removal refinement. The other thing that you would start to see with even the earliest shoulder planes is they had all a bunch of different bumps on it. You look at this, it's a rectangle. You know, you've got some nice chamfers and sometimes you can get some lamb's tongues on here. It's purely decorative, but it's really a rectangular block. The shoulder plane, and this Veritas especially, it's got multiple handles and all kinds of doojiggies on it <coughs> so that you can set it on its side, you can run it sideways with this handle up in the air. It's also got this hole back here. It's got this little kind of thumb catch here. There's places to hold it in a lot of different areas because it's really meant to be held from a bunch of different grips and approach from a couple different directions. It's meant to be pushed. It also can be very easily pulled in order to prevent spelching on one side of the joint or the other. Even this little version, this small version of the Veritas shoulder plane, it's the same way. It's got obviously, you know, the, the desire to want to go in one direction, but this hole, this is not a speed hole. This is not for wind resistance. This allows you to hook a finger into it and pull it back towards you. Or on a very light cut, when I'm butted up against a tenon shoulder and I can't really put my hand over the top, it's meant to give it a little bit of room to push. Very delicate um, ability to, to pull it and push it. But again, if you're trying to take a heavy cut, you're not gonna have a lot of success with a really light fingertip grip. Some of the other um, uh, shoulder planes got to be the point where there was a front end where it was removable and you could turn it into a bullnose plane. These Veritas planes have an adjustable mouth, so I can move this in and out and tighten it up. And here again, I would only want to tighten it up if I'm doing a really fine cut, if I'm trying to control tear out, or if I'm trying to create a really precise result. Same thing with this plane. You can advance this little set screw and move the, the, the um, sole in and out. Obviously, the rabbit plane with a wooden sole, not so much. It's not really designed for any adjustment because it's designed to remove a lot of wood fast. So the advent of the shoulder plane at 
you know, the time in history when it became more relevant, we had already started to see some mechanization. We started the age of industrialization and there were tools now that were doing the grunt work. And we needed that, what we today call hybrid approach. We needed the hand tool to come in and help refine the work that had been done on a grosser level using a rotary tool, using a saw, um, whatever. Water powered, electric power, whatever. There was now that division of labor where we had an opportunity to refine things. And that exists still today, obviously. And I think that's why when I was getting started in hand tools, this was really before the, you know, the, the renaissance of hand tools that we see today. This was kind of at the beginning of slightly before this current renaissance. And everybody that was getting into hand tools was still lots of power tools in their shop. I mean, if you go back on this channel, 10 years, 12 years, you're gonna see table saws and joiners. I mean, heck, I still have a planer in the corner of my shop, but I had a fully equipped power tool shop. That's the way I grew up in woodworking, if you will. I'm a, you know, watching New Yankee Workshop and watching David Marks and such, all power tools. As I started to integrate hand tools into my shop, it was to augment the ability that I had with certain power tools. And that I think is where the shoulder plane plays a valid role. If say you're cutting your tenons on the table saw and you just want to refine them slightly and tweak a fit, then the shoulder plane has some merit to there. And that really, that's the first task. The shoulder of the tenon is really where the shoulder plane excels. And in my opinion, it's really the only place the shoulder plane excels. Every other task, even if you're cutting your joinery with a machine and refining it by hand, every other task can be accomplished with a different tool. So that being said, let's jump in and actually do some woodworking instead of me just jabbering on. Um, as usual, please feel free to throw questions into the chat room. Love the questions. Let's keep this as interactive as possible. Um, if, you, uh, if you do have a question, put it in all caps for me so that it makes it a little bit easier for me to pick it out through the, uh, the, the other white noise that may be going on in the, the room. So um, let's do this. Shoulder, let's talk about a tenon shoulder first and foremost, because as I said, I think that's probably the, the task that the shoulder plane does better than anything else. So I happen to have a tenon that's already cut. Back out a little bit there. Technically it's a half lap. We'll call it a blind face tenon, but it is, Obviously hand sawed, you can just see by the tool marks on here that it's hand sawed. But say I was a chicken <laughs> and I stayed away from my shoulder line, I've got a little bit of material to remove, or say it's not square or it's not flat and I need to refine it. Maybe I've tried to fit this and I, I've got a gap and it's not coming together. Well, the shoulder plane can be brought to bear to fix that. But here is why I really found the large shoulder plane to be kind of silly. If this tool is meant for refinement only, do I really need a tool with this much mass and this big of a blade? This is what a one inch blade on the large shoulder plane. It's really kind of silly. So this particular Veritas shoulder plane, I think the last time I used it was like four years ago. So those of you who really wanted one of these on the Lee Valley second sale, um, you might contact me, maybe we can make a deal because <laughs> I just don't use this thing. That prompted me to purchase this guy. Um, and this is a relatively new purchase, as you can tell, there's very little patina on the thing. Granted, it's been kept um, very clean and it doesn't actually get used that much, but this plane made a lot more sense because why I wanna use the shoulder plane is for chewing a tenon sheet. Well, you can see, here's a typical furniture size tenon, right? And I've got a shoulder here that is just about a quarter of an inch. And that's actually, that's a pretty typical shoulder, if not a little narrower than that. So why would I use a big one inch plane that isn't gonna balance very well, it's kind of tippy, big long plane on a little tiny shoulder for like a rail and style, when I can use a plane that actually is narrow enough that it almost balances there on its own. And I can see what I'm doing a lot more. So I can come in here and remove an ingrain shaving very easily and true up that shoulder. Now there's always going to be a, a possibility of spelching or blowing out the end if I go all the way across. 
Now, certainly if you're taking a light refining cut, any spelching you get won't be that bad. But here again is where the, all the little lumps and bumps on these planes can be beneficial, where I can flip it around, put my finger in that hole and come back the other way and kind of work towards the middle till I get a, you know, really beautiful tenon shoulder. This is exactly opposite of how I'd normally work. Normally I would flip this 180 degrees and I'd be working on this side instead of working on the side far from me where I can't really see what I'm doing. But hey, it's all about the camera work. Again, flip it around, come back the other way. And you can get a really beautiful shoulder that assuming this face, this plane here is where you want it. If I push this flat up against it, I'm gonna get a shoulder that is square to this plane. So that's something to be said as well. A good shoulder plane should have a, a face that is square to the sole. That's of pretty utmost importance. You could say the same thing for a rabbit plane, but honestly, you've got a little bit more wiggle room with these guys. But here is the perfect use for a shoulder plane, trimming the shoulder of a tenon. Go figure, that's why we call it a shoulder plane. Cuts in grain really, really well and the ability to flip it around and use it, you know, in kind of awkward positions with all the different handholds is perfect for this. Now, again, with a light cut, I can actually go all the way across and not get any spelching. I mean, this is pretty nice, dense cherry here. I've got just a tiny bit of frayed there, um, but you know, it's, it's, it's perfect for that. And I've got a gorgeous, smooth, flat shoulder. But what if I needed to true up the tenon cheek itself? Which, you know, certainly that's gonna come up quite a bit. So let's back up here a little. Come over to my bench hook. And I think what I'll do is demonstrate a little on this tenon cheek, but I'll switch to uh, a larger one that may show up a little better on camera. So if I wanted to true this, <laughs> this is actually already joined to something, so it makes it a little bit awkward, but I'll just drape it off the bench hook. And if you wanted to true up this tenon cheek, say uh, it's a little fat on one end over the other, uh, it's not flat from the, the toe to the shoulder. There'd be all kinds of things you need to true up here. Certainly, this little guy doesn't make any sense, right? You know, here, you'd have to make a bunch of overlapping passes and you're just asking for error. So then, okay, well, maybe that's why we've got the larger shoulder plane. But here again, the large shoulder plane is an inch. Is it an inch or is it one and a quarter? I think it's one and a quarter. Yeah, so that nobody corrects me. It is a one and a quarter inch blade. But there's not a lot of instances where I'm making a one and a quarter inch long tenon. Most of the tenons I make are at least one and a half inches, if not two inches. Certainly on smaller projects, this is, this is great. And I could come in and I can true this up. But here again, I've got the possibility of spelching out the other side. So I could flip it around and pull back to prevent that spelching. I can lay it on its side and I can true up the tenon shoulder um, like I just did mount it upright in the vise. But here again, I've got to make overlapping passes and I don't have quite as much control. Um, this can very easily flatten out a surface, but what I find more than anything is you end up tapering it. Because this plane is so massive and because it's so much longer than the width of the tenon, it gets really tippy. So you end up kind of planing down at an angle and inevitably the tenon ends up skinnier thinner on the far side than on the front side. So then I end up coming up and just focusing my passes here, and then I end up with a peak in the middle. And it doesn't end up doing a very good job flattening out the surface because it's just, it's outsized for the job. Certainly if I were shaping a tenon, you know, that was long like this guy, this might make a little bit more sense. Certainly I've got um, the width, you know, this is more of a, of a filister of an ingrain rabbit. But again, this tool is meant for light 
removal. It's taking really light passes. So I've got a really rough surface here and it'll take for flipping ever to true this up. I'll come back to that in a minute. So truing the tenon cheek of your typical tenon cheek like this, I could actually go to a rabbit plane, but what happened in my shop is I went a totally different direction. And I found that the rabbiting block plane is the better solution. First and foremost, I've got a wider blade right away. I can cover more of the tenon. I've got a much shorter body so that I can control it a lot more. It's a lot lighter. It fits in the palm of my hand really nicely so I can hold the piece in place. And I can very easily take short passes to remove maybe some thickness on one end or I can take full length passes or full width passes, I should say, to remove everything. And I get a really flat surface a lot faster with a lot more precision control because I'm not having to take so many overlapping passes. And with this blade being what, one and three quarters, I'm gonna find that a lot of my tenons are gonna be one and three quarters to one and a half. And that's a perfect length for this. On a tenon that's slightly shorter than this, I can do it in one pass. This ends up being the better tool for this particular action. Honestly though, my favorite tool for truing up a tenon cheek, well, let's be real. My favorite tool for truing up a tenon cheek is a tenon saw. Saw to your line, get the cut right off your saw and you don't have to worry about it. I realize that's easier said than done, but this is one of the reasons that I say hand planes are not the most important tool in the shop. The most important tool in the shop are these guys in all shapes and forms. The better you can get with your sawing, the more your joinery fits off the saw. You don't have to worry about any of this crap. None of this fiddling around and, and, and messing with joints, all that ends up doing generally is making joints that fit worse. So if you're gonna work on something, work on your sawing, that will improve things a lot faster. So, okay, we, we've said that. Let's say we can't, you know, we still have something that we sawed as pretty well as we could, but we still have some things to true up. I actually find that the chisel works the best. Um, in this particular instance, what I wanna do is use a hold fast, because now I want both hands in the operation. I've got it pressed up against a fence. And what I would probably more likely wanna do is position it off to this side. Um, yeah, let's, let's change a different piece. Because I've got this already joined together. I can't really put it up against my fence. If this was something I did for a draw bore. Let's change to a different example piece here. In fact, let's just go ahead and saw this shoulder. sawed this tenon cheek, so I don't know if I've actually sawed it all the way through. I don't think I have. Nope. Pardon me one second. There we go. So now, fresh tenon cheek, or fresh half lap, if you will. And what I want to do now is, since I'm left-handed, I want to position it off, kind of hanging off the side of my bench hook or, you know, better yet, maybe even backed up against the fence a little, but I want some access to the thing. And if I've got my, my um, tenon laid out, which I should, especially if you're cutting it by hand, I've still got lines to work to. And woodworking is just about working to a line. So I can grab a chisel and I've got full visibility over what I'm doing. I can rely on the flat back of the chisel. I'm specifically using 
a wider one and a half inch chisel because I've got more reference surface on the chisel. And I can rely upon the flat back of the chisel to guide me to the high spots. You know, I've definitely got a high spot right here in the middle as I run my chisel across. It's just grabbing those high spots and removing them. So now I can come back over here. And with the chisel, I've cleaned up that face. Is it a clean face? I've got kind of a polished face where I paired away and I've got a little bit more of a sawn face where the low spots were, but it is a flat face. Who cares if it's pretty? It's a glue surface. In fact, one might say you'd have more teeth on a rough surface. I don't know, that's probably BS, but this is not going to be seen, so it doesn't really matter. But I can very easily come in and across the grain. I can remove right down to a line and I can see everything I'm doing. I've got a lot more flexibility and agility with this tool even than I have over something like this where the work is covered up. You know, the cutting is happening in here, but I can't see it because I've got the sole in front of it. I can see exactly where I'm cutting and I can make slicing cuts, I can make these pivoting cuts and get a lot of control over exactly where I'm moving material. And just like I talk about with hand planing a board where I wanna spot plane it and remove the high spots, if I have a high spot right there and only right there, it can be difficult to remove that high spot with this plane, or I can come in with the chisel and just remove that high spot right there. A lot more control. If I've got a shoulder that's out of whack, well, here again, this is a good excuse to use your shoulder plane. I can come in and true that up, that's really nice. Or I could do the same thing with the chisel if you wanted. Or what I usually find is that an undercut shoulder performs better than a perfectly square shoulder. So a lot of times what I'll do is put this upright in a vise and come in with the chisel and undercut it slightly. It's a lot more awkward when it's laying horizontally on the bench like this. Undercut that shoulder and now you ensure you've got a tight fit out here where it counts. So trimming tenon cheeks, this is definitely not the tool for that. Sometimes I've seen people going with this method with a router plane. That works. I find it's a hell of a lot slower. And unless you've got another piece over on this side that is balancing on, a lot of times the router plane tends to tip on you. So, you know, if you've got multiple pieces, it might make sense, but I still find that to be a lot slower and less efficient than just the good old chisel. I mean, let's face it, every tool in our shop is emulating this guy. This is a chisel held at an angle in a plane. This is a whole bunch of chisels put on a plate of spring steel. You know, they're all emulating this guy. Everybody wants to do what this guy can do. So uh, work on your, your chisel skills and you'll end up being better off. So that brings us to, let's say wider. Um, we've got our, our tenons refined, um, so maybe we want to deal with an ingrain rabbit, or the, the more arcane term would be the philister. So let's use this bit, um, this is from my curve, uh, curve cutting uh, broadcast. So the number one way that I'm going to cut a philister or really any cross grain rabbit is it's going to start with a saw. I want to saw that shoulder. There are planes like the moving philister plane or the, the modern Veritas moving philister plane that have a knicker on it that does a cross grain cut. I don't trust them. They work okay, but you can't beat laying out your, your shoulder with a knife and sawing that shoulder. Because once the, so the shoulder is sawn, then I can move to uh, a more coarse operation where I'm actually going to chop out the bulk of the waste and then refine it from there. So, where's my chisel? I've got a shoulder sawn here. I can come in and grab a chisel, come right from the ingrain, 
and essentially split out my waist. And because the shoulder is already cut, the material just severs away right at the shoulder. Or not severs away, just falls away right at the shoulder. The other alternative is working more across the grain with a chisel again. You can even come in, bevel down, and because, again, the saw is coming and cut cross grain, you can work with a mallet, bevel down, taking advantage of the weaker cross grain here, and just chopping away. That can be a really fast way. But regardless, what you end up with is a surface that looks very much like this. It's very lumpy and bumpy. And as I showed earlier, I can try to refine this, but it's going to take a while because I'm taking a light cut. If I try to advance this too far, it's going to clog. So then I've got to move the mouth back. But the problem is, is this plane has so much mass, a lot of times it's going to get caught. And you can see it doesn't want to cut because the toe is actually catching on these little bumps. What I really need is a tool that's set to cut more aggressively. And this guy, this can actually be set a lot more aggressive than it is right now. This guy quickly levels all those high spots and it brings it down a lot faster. I'm gonna advance the blade on this a little. There we go. And because it has a skewed blade, it's leaving me a really nice surface across the grain. You'll also notice, see that? See that escapement where the, blade, the shavings just eject out to the side? You get those longer shavings, and they eject out to the side. Now that I've got a more refined surface, I can come in with this shoulder plane and make the same cut. But this is a straight blade. It's not gonna leave as clean a surface across the grain, but also, is not ejecting the shavings. They're piling up in the mouth. Now this large shoulder plane has a big old mouth, but you make one or two passes here and it starts to clog up the mouth, which is going to affect how it's cutting. In the end, this guy is so much faster. Moreover, if I wanted to trim the vertical wall or the end grain, I can flip it on its side and do the same thing that I was doing with the shoulder plane earlier. The other thing that I find is these planes are a little bit taller. I mean, this large shoulder plane is not that much shorter, but the body itself is taller. It's a lot easier to actually hold this and keep it running vertical or plumb. So you're not throwing the wall out of square. That's one of the big issues that I have with this guy, this modern Veritas is it's got such a low profile, it's really easy to angle off to the side. And a lot of people have trouble with the floor of the rabbit sloping down. Plus you end up relying too much on the fence, which means this surface has to be a reference surface. And what if you don't wanna true up that end grain? What if you just wanna focus on this shoulder being the true reference surface? The rabbit plane is a much better tool for the job. It cuts really, really cleanly. And of course, if you had a really narrow uh, rabbit, this little guy would work just as well. So these cross grain uh, rabbits or philisters, ultimately the philister plane is the same. This plane and this plane are the same. This one just has more doohickeys. It's got a, uh, a knicker, it's got a depth stop, it's got a movable fence and allows you to make a little bit more repeatable cuts. This guy is exactly the same cutting action, actually a lot more agile because it doesn't have fences and things that get in the way, but that's a whole other topic that I, I know I've talked about in the past. So that brings us to um, actual rabbits, you know? It's called a rabbit plane. Let's cut a rabbit. And this is where I see a lot of woodworkers now using the shoulder plane to cut a rabbit or kind of the interchangeable rabbit plane, shoulder plane. They are not the same beast. And when you try to cut a rabbit with this guy, you end up with all kinds of problems. So I'm gonna just cut a short one. I don't necessarily wanna pull out a long, but well, now let's just stay on the current setup I have here. Um, let's set up on the other side of my bench hook 
By the way, folks, if you don't have a bench hook, you want one. Bench hooks are awesome. Anybody who says, well, I don't have a workbench, I can't do anything, you'll notice the workbench, well, granted, the dog hole is nice, but, you know, it's my workbench on top of my workbench, my bench hook that's doing all the work here, providing all the work holding. I don't even necessarily need this hold fast, but in the case of the rabbit, the hold fast just adds a little bit of, a, of, of strength here. So say I wanted a rabbit, and let's make one that's maybe an inch or so wide. And I'll mark knife in the edge. <clears throat> now, I could start planing with my shoulder plane and you'll find that, you know, some folks will suggest starting away from the line and planing right away. See how that, I mean, this rabbit is, is what? 12 inches long at most, but already the mouth of this guy is full. It'll compress a lot more. I could take a couple more passes, but it's going to just clog up in there and that will cause the plane to stop cutting. It'll also cause it to deflect a little bit. But you'll also notice I had to take a really, really fine shaving there. And it was actually a lot harder because I'm driving this low angle, massive blade along the grain. It's really designed to cut in grain, not along the grain. So, you know, Veritas is nice. I can open the mouth, I can increase the depth of cut, but you'll find that it only gets harder and harder to push the thing. So here again is an example where this is a situation where the rabbit would have already been cut by like a router or a dado blade and you're just refining it. But even then you're finding that there's, there's a lot more work to refine it with that big heavy shoulder plane versus this rabbit plane. Moreover, I'm gonna come right up to the knife line here, lean the plane over so that it's riding on its sharp edge. I'm gonna cut a V groove right on my knife line. Pretty deep one too. Again, you can see how aggressive this plane is set. This plane is now just running on that V groove. Now, I'm gonna slightly tilt the plane back down towards vertical. But here again, the upright body of this plane, positioned with my thumb on top and my fingers trailing over the side, I really get a feel for square, what's square and what's not square. You can just hear the difference. I mean, the thickness of that shaving I'm pulling out of there, that's like a 32nd of an inch thick. That might be a little bit heavy, but hey, we're having fun. So now if I've got some refinement that needs to happen along the shoulder, I can come back right on my knife line position the plane vertically, or I can drop it down on its side and I can work right on the vertical wall here. So if you needed to maybe refine it back to the knife line, you could do that very easily right there. Imagine taking this short 12 inch rabbit and turning into something like you're making moldings and you've got an eight foot long board. This sucker is gonna clog up about two feet into it. This one is just gonna keep spitting shavings off to the side and you're gonna work all day long very, very quickly. Now I might have this set a little bit too coarse for fast removal, but what if I also chopped out some of this waste like I did before? Um, and I just needed to level it out like we did on this filister here. You can see how quickly this plane is going to do the job over this plane. So it's not necessarily me saying shoulder planes are useless, shoulder planes are silly. In my shop, they don't serve much of a purpose because I'm not starting my joint elsewhere 
and then refining with hand tools. I'm starting my joint with hand tools and taking it to finish with hand tools. So what I'm trying to do is get there as quickly as I can, more as efficiently as I can with the hand tools. So in a hybrid shop, you may find more use for a shoulder plane, but I still submit that mostly what you're gonna find use for is the actual shoulder of the tenon and the other tweaking of the tenon, like the cheek and such, it does not make sense to use the shoulder plane. You're gonna find more use from like a rabbiting block plane. And for that matter, the rabbiting block plane will handle shoulders just as well. It's a little bit tippy because it's so much wider, but it will do the job because again, with the shoulder being relatively narrow, it's, it's a little bit easier to balance that light of a cut. Outside of shoulders, I don't really see much of a use for these. Now, there's going to be people out there who think I'm full of it and think, you know, you're nuts. I use my shoulder plane all the time. And that's probably just the way you work. It's perfectly fine. I would love, you know, especially people watching this now or people watching this off into the future, you know, put in the comments how you're using your shoulder plane or maybe how you've overcome some of the limitations that I've showed earlier. I'd be willing to bet those of you who are using the shoulder plane actively right now are creating that joint using another tool or using a power tool and you're just using this to refine the, the joinery. Again, that's the big difference. The shoulder plane is purely a refinement tool. It's not a joinery making tool, it is a joinery refining tool. Kind of like the router plane actually. It doesn't do real well taking heavy cuts. So it's a much better tool for your, oops, your lighter refinement type work. Questions on that? Those are the three examples that I showed in that blog post all those years ago and how I do it uh, using a rabbit plane. Don't underestimate the chisel, guys. I, in, in recent years, I found myself going more and more back to using a chisel as my primary tool. And a lot of times, it's just because it happens to be in my hand. And it's like, granted, it's not like it's a huge deal to stop and turn grab a new tool, but the chisel's already in my hands. Nine times out of 10, if I had to refine a tenon fit, I'll do it with a chisel because I've got so much more visibility over what I'm doing that uh, it's, it's, it's really my preferred tool for just about all the joinery enhancements that I do. I'm seeing the chat room bounce all kinds of stuff up. Um, Uh, how tight are the mouths on modern wooden rabbit plane makers planes? Um, they are going to be tight. And, and this is not a modern maker or a vintage maker. They all came tight. Smoothing planes, jack planes, you know, rabbit planes, everything. The mouth came tight. It was up to the workmen to open the mouth to their benefit. You know, um, as you made the wooden plane, you made it to be really, really tight so that the workman had the option to finesse it. Um, and that's one of the ways you can tell whether or not a plane got a lot of use is if it still had a really, really tight mouth, it probably didn't get that much use. But um, like this guy, I love this rabbit plane, big two and a half inch rabbit plane, enormous mouth. And it looks like it's been attacked by a beaver. Um, the mouth on this, the opening of the mouth, uh, you know, you think about a smoothing plane, the tightness in the mouth helps control tear out. Tear out is not an issue with this. This is a plane that's making joinery. Oftentimes it's controlling tear out because of the skewed blade, not because of the mouth. So the mouth has been moved way out of the way. This mouth is <laughs> almost a quarter inch wide and it's not an even quarter inch. You can see where somebody's filed it more in the middle. Whereas if I look at my Bickford rabbit plane, this, well, this is, I've actually opened this a little bit. Um, I had trouble for a while when I first got this, however many years ago that was, 2008, 2009, I think when I got this, I found that it was clogging a lot. And I actually wrote Matt and Matt said, yeah, you might want to open the mouth. And I remember going, eh, I don't want to touch it. It's such a beautiful plane. I don't want to screw it up. And he's like, no, that's kind of what you're supposed to do. <laughs> um, so I actually opened this up a little bit and it's still pretty tight. I mean, I can't even really measure that. It's probably, it's less than a 16th. It's probably less than a 32nd of an inch open. But um, this 
is going, this is the, the tool that I use for much more um, delicate rabbits or more precise rabbits. If I'm cutting really detailed profiles and I need the rabbit to, that the rabbit that's gonna precede the hollow and round, I need that rabbit to be right out of line that's actually the tool that I bring to bear. Um, I'm fortunate that I've, I've bought a lot of rabbit planes over the years. Um, this little guy is set really rank. This takes huge amounts of material off. Um, this is a quarter inch, uh, no, three eighths, three eighths. Yeah, three eighths inch rabbit plane I got from Josh Clark at Hyper Kitten. Um, and it's set really coarse. So it hogs off material really quickly. And then I actually switch over to this Bickford plane and kind of work right back to my knife line. I could adjust the plane, you know, but I'm at the point now where I just bought another rabbit plane and that's what I use it for. So it's kind of like my smoothing plane of rabbits and it has the tightest mouth of any of the ones that I open uh, or any of the ones that I own. Um, yeah, and a lot of that is because I was just afraid to open it because it was such a beautiful plane. Um, the one thing I will say about shoulder planes, oh, good, and Paul just said it. The, the large planes, I just don't get them. And for that matter, the medium ones, as I said, I had a medium Lee Nielsen for years and I just didn't find a lot of use for it. The medium, I think, is about three quarters of an inch wide. Um, it's too narrow for tenon cheeks um, and it's too wide for most of the tenon shoulders. Now, you may run into situations where you're cutting you know, big, heavy joinery, like workbench joinery. I don't think shoulder planes are good, your solution there either. If you take a shoulder plane and you have a one inch wide tenon shoulder and you're trying to two that up with the shoulder plane, you're gonna find that's a lot of work. Try removing a one inch wide shaving of ingrain you know, of something hard like ash. It's really hard to do. You have to really dial the cut back. And even then, it's a lot of work in order to do that. You're still better off um, with even a smaller plane like this rabbiting block plane because of the lower angle, the way you can hold it with two hands, I find that it's still a better ergonomic design for moving a heavier amount of wood. So to me, the large shoulder plane has absolutely no purpose. Um, none at all. They look really cool. What, and this is why I ended up buying this guy. And you saw, you know, really, hopefully you saw just how easy it was to trim up a typical furniture, furniture size tenon with this small plane. And I've got this typical shoulder I've still got more than half the plane blade that's not being used. So I could cut a much larger shoulder on, you know, eight quarter stock. If I've got an eight quarter board, having a three eighths inch wide shoulder on either side of the tendon is probably gonna be somewhat common. This is a great plane for that. Even if the shoulder were a little bit wider, maybe then I might find a use for a medium shoulder plane, but definitely not the large shoulder plane. They just don't just don't like them. <laughs> I don't see the point of them. Um, but here I own one because I was told you must have one. And I just found the more that I focused on hand tools, the less important that tool was in my shop.